Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and today we're continuing Hour 2 of Guy Talk. And in a perfect world between Hour 1 and Hour 2, the Guy Talk guys would have eaten pizza, but it's not a perfect world. (laughs) And I just need to... But we're praying for it. (laughs) Yeah, you pray away, pal, because it ain't going to happen. All right, uh, we have uh, a great hour ahead of us, and all you have to do, if you have a question, is text it over 877-933-2484, and we will... Do our best to answer it. All right, I've got my power panel once again. I've got a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher. I've got Greg Borgond, Tom Parrish, and Jeff Verdorn. That's the team today. <laughs> under, so under, definitely under. I love it. Definitely yep. under. All right. Yep. Do I get a reward for that? Or <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Here's the first question in Acts eighteen twenty four to twenty six. Apollos has been taught the way of the Lord but only knew of John's baptism. Can you explain this further for me, please? I think you had a pretty good insight, Jeff, in terms of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think a lot of people heard the gospel, but like on the day of Pentecost, we don't hear about all of them, you know, coming down with the Spirit, although the Spirit was there. But I, the Spirit comes as the Spirit comes and moves us to believe, but there's more to it than we understand. Yeah, I think we have the baptism of John, and then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So back in Acts 10 and 11, if you recall, Peter uh, had this vision of the tablecloth coming down and um, many meanings there, but one of them was that he was to go to this Gentile's house, Cornelius, and he was to preach the gospel. And it says that the Holy Spirit came upon them, the Gentiles, just as it had come upon the Jews at the beginning, meaning at Pentecost. And so Peter then says that that and equates that receiving of the Holy Spirit with this phrase of baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says, remember what the Lord said, that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that receiving the Holy Spirit is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think, you know, not everybody understood that right away. So here's Apollos. He's preaching Christ, and but he needed a couple of uh, other Uh, believers to come along and say, hey, you're still preaching this baptism, which was unto repentance, and you're Mm -hmm. missing the truth about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is this new birth, this rebirth, this being born again, which is receiving the Holy Spirit. And so I I like, what does it say later? It says that he went on to refute the Jews preaching... um, Showing the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. Perfect. So... It sounds like this was a pretty good guy that now has a a better understanding of the fullness of salvation. Yep. All right. Nicely done. 877-933-2484 to text your question over. All right, gentlemen, do I have to like a brother in Christ? I know I should love my neighbor and not hate anyone, but there are some personalities I don't like. Is that sinful? Well, let's take a look at what love really means. We're talking, in this case, agape love or unconditional love, which I define as having a genuine concern for the welfare and well-being of another individual, even if they're unlikable. Mm -hmm. And when you practice that action-oriented, others-oriented type of love, I guarantee this will happen. You will find something emotionally lovable about that individual over time where you may have started off disliking that individual But again, having a genuine concern for the welfare and well-being of another individual, even if they're unlikable. I like that. Yeah, from a pastoral point of view, uh, I've run into plenty of people I don't like (laughs) that are Christians. (laughs) But you're right. I had to learn looking out for their welfare, looking out for their growth in the Lord, looking out for what the the Spirit wanted to do. It was amazing how my likes changed over time. Now, would I say they were my best friend and I wanted to be with them and go fishing all the time? No. But I didn't avoid them either. I found myself gravitating to them or wanting to talk to them. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with you, Greg. That's exactly what we should be doing. All right. Nicely done. How do I stop comparing myself to others? 
don't compare yourself to others. And they just made it real easy, Jeff. But it's a great. Uh, it is. It's, it's, it's a, a really point. good question, and I, I'm just trying to be funny a little bit here because this is a hard thing. We, everything we do, and and so much of our language is comparative, right? He's rich. He's poor. Well, what's really rich? If we all had a billion dollars, would we all be rich or not? If we all had nothing, would we all be poor? If we were all seven feet tall, would we all be tall or not? You know, see what I'm saying? Sure. We, so much of our identity is comparing ourselves to others. I think this goes down to one of the commands in the Ten Commandments about coveting. You can compare yourself to others, but if you're now coveting what they have and you don't, I think that's when you cross the line. You don't get your sense of identity from others. You get your identity from Christ. Yes. It's who you are in Christ that matters. Your identity is from him. Mm. And so when you're comparing yourself to others, what you're essentially saying, even without saying it is, well, maybe Christ wasn't good enough, and so I'm going to compare myself to others. It was, I think, Rick Warren some years ago who made the comment that stuck with me. He says, live your life for an audience of one and everything else will come clearer if you choose to live your life for an audience of one and getting your identity from that one capital O-N-E, God himself through Christ. I would encourage the listener to do this. Um, <clears throat> if you've got to go to UPS and have it printed, but make yourself a poster. And I'm dead serious. I was 2 Corinthians 5 you know, 16 to 21, because over and over it says there that you, as a believer, are the ministers of the gospel. You are the ambassadors of reconciliation. If we don't get our identity from Jesus, we will always be comparing ourselves to others, and that doesn't help us because we can't measure up to others, and we shouldn't. But Jesus is the one we're called to be, to identify with, and I have done that now for the last 10 years with a lot of my confirmation kits. And it's fun to see them as adults now, you know, 10 years later, so they're in their early 20s or whatever, coming back to me or emailing me and saying, I still am an ambassador of the gospel. I thank you, Pastor, for helping me identify who I am, because it sure wasn't easy in college. Everybody wanted to identify me as something or other, but I knew who I was, and it kept me out of a lot of trouble. So type that up, get it printed, put it on your wall, and I would encourage you to look at it every day and put your name in there. Um, it was Neil T. Anderson in Freedom in Christ Ministries who wrote the book, um, uh, you know, about identity in Christ, victory over darkness. He has a whole chapter on what it looks like to take to to get your identity from Christ. I actually had just what you said. I had it printed up, Smart. and it sits in in our in, in the in a powder room in our home on the mirror, and so that people are reminded that who they get their identity from. It's not from others. Our identity is from Christ. He sees us different than the world sees us. And God has given us this robe of righteousness because of what Christ did at the cross, and he sees us differently than the world. So we need to get our cues from our creator and not the creature. You know, one of the most important characteristics that anyone has are those characteristics that come in Christ. So when you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You've been made righteous. You're now a child of the Most High God. You want to start comparing yourself to others. um, Those are your greatest characteristics, right? You are victorious. You are an overcomer. You are filled with the Spirit. You will, you will, will reign with Christ, as we were talking about earlier. Start comparing those things, and nobody has anything on you, uh, because all those in Christ have all those promises. Nicely done, gentlemen. All right, here's my next question. Um, a pastor I listen to says that any community service or charity work that is not done through the church or a Christian organization is meaningless to God. What are your thoughts on this? I totally disagree. Yeah. Every act of grace administered to somebody in need is an act of worship to God. It doesn't need to go through the vehicle of the church or any other agency. It's who you are in Christ, and so you're to reach out, and every act is an act of worship to God. I agree. Every single Christian, by themselves, 
although we want them all to be part of the church, but by themselves and their actions, is representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And quite frankly, uh, I would love to see more Christians reaching out in that way, because churches by themselves cannot organize everything and have enough people to keep it organized. But when you see people in need, when you see people that need to be counseled, when you see people that need to be listened to, be Jesus to them. I think that's wonderful. I think God honors random acts of kindness. He does. Mm. You know, the local church is a very important component of God's economy in this world. The local church is. But whenever believers come together, that is church. It's whenever two or more are gathered in his name. So, um, you know, you can do good work outside of your local church. Sure can. All right. I was baptized as an infant and confirmed and I've been wondering if I need to be baptized again to be assured I have received the Holy Spirit, as in the book of Acts, and wondering if it would change me for the better. Can you offer advice? We're asked to be obedient and to be baptized. I, I too, was baptized as an infant and was confirmed in a particular denomination. But as an infant, I obviously didn't know what I was doing. And what baptism, what I've learned from Scripture, baptism is identifying with the finished work of Christ. It's an example, and you proclaim it out loud, verbally, about being buried uh, in, and then being resurrected again to a new life. And so I would encourage the person to seriously consider it, because it's a demonstration of your commitment to Christ. Here I am, a Lutheran, who does baptize infants as well as children and adults. And I would say to this person, if you feel that strongly about it, you know, be baptized again. Because if there, if, you know, as the creed says, there is only one baptism for the remission of sins. So if Lutherans are wrong and infant baptism is wrong, then definitely get baptized. But if you were baptized and it is the one time that the Holy Spirit works, you haven't lost a thing. So the point is, I agree with Greg, go be baptized again if that's how you feel. And there are plenty of people out there that will enable you to do that. The true baptism that truly saves is the baptism of the Holy Holy Spirit Spirit. that we were talking about earlier, right? That's receiving of the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe and are saved, I'll focus, I agree with you guys in your comments on baptism. I'll focus on the last part of that question where it says, well, I think she said, will it make me a better person? Is that correct? Is that what the the last part of that question Mm -hmm. is? And would it change me for the better? Oh, would it change me for the better? Yeah. You know, I think as we submit to Christ, as we don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, I think that is what changes us, that transforming power of the Spirit of God. Um, I I don't know that going into water will will change your life. I, I agree with you, Tom, that if you're feeling called to be baptized as a public profession of your uh, being born again, do it. Sure. And uh, whether or not you got baptized as, as an infant or not. But I don't know if it will change them for Well, the my better. brother-in-law has been baptized seven times. <laughs> and I'm, I'm dead serious. He's been baptized seven times because every different church you went to had a different formula or a way for doing it. And he's gone through all of those. And he admits it hasn't changed anything for him. And my counsel to him is look to Jesus yeah, exactly. <laughs> more than anything else. But if you're making baptism a public declaration of your faith and you're— your small group in your church of 14 people meet you at the lake some night and baptize you. Is that a public declaration? If everyone who's witnessing that knows you or is it a little, is it a church activity? Yeah, there's, I think we explain baptism in a lot of different ways. That's one. Another is, is it's a, it's an, a physical representation of an inward change. In other words, we Mm -hmm. can't see the Holy spirit coming upon somebody uh, but we can see someone come up out of the water. You know, oftentimes someone will say, "Buried, uh, t- buried in, in death, uh, and raised in newness of life." At the moment that someone is mm-hmm. baptized, in the end, Scripture says, "Believe, be baptized, and follow me." So there is this um, a pattern, especially in the early church, where someone believed. They were immediately baptized, and then they became a Christian and followed Christ. And it was an affiliation. In fact, baptism was not specifically a Christian thing in the first century. It was a general understanding that if you were baptized into something, you were baptized into that group or that 
community, in other words, that you are now going to identify with that community. So that's all baptism is, is an identification. Um, if you were saved a long time ago and haven't been baptized yet today, um, there, I think you can make a strong case that, hey, you don't have to be baptized by water, um, you know, years after your salvation. I don't know what you guys think about that. Um, but in the end, it's it's it's... I think it's an act of submission as much as it is anything else. That I'm going to baptize to identify with Christ, and and hopefully there's more people there than just the 14 that were there, or at least uh, see it or recognize it, or you talk about it that you've been baptized. There's something amazing about making a public declaration, even with this, it's in front of a small group of people, people that you may have grown up with, they may be just your relatives, but when you publicly declare out loud your profession of faith demonstrated by your baptism, it does, I think, change you a bit. Every baptism I've ever been involved in or administering baptisms, when people come out of that water, there's something unique that takes place. There's an exhilaration. There's a feeling of weight being lifted off your shoulders. There's a fine, okay, I finally said it. I finally said how I, I, I intend to live my life to people that matter in my life. And they're generally the hardest people to declare that to. When people go through Heart of a Warrior and, and Phase 1, 2, and 3, I have them come together in a celebration, and they publicly declare in front of their spouse or a significant other how they intend to live their life differently from that point on. It's no longer a mental gymnastic. They're actually publicly declaring it. They're fearful of it initially, but when they've done it, they feel so much better having declared it. It, it can be a very important step for us planting our flag for the Lord. Yep. And then, and I can, can I go, do we have time for me to go one step further with this? Yeah, how long is your step? Oh, it's only 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it's a teeny step. Uh, I have watched a lot of people be baptized, and then simply it doesn't make much difference in their life. They just go on living the way they had. So I agree. There should be, I believe it should be public at all times. Here's the bottom line. I coach football for many years. Baptism is like the kickoff of the football game, and you're on the line for the first time in your entire life. So you're in the game. But you know what? That's the kickoff. Now you've got the rest of the game to score the touchdowns, to do mm-hmm. what you're called to do, and to win mm-hmm. the game. That's what we don't teach people well, that baptism is certainly the beginning, and it's a public declaration, and it is proclaiming Jesus. But how are you going to do that tomorrow? Yeah, it's it's a start, but it's week? not a finish. It's not a finish. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, we'll take a little break. Just got a nice note. Uh, Mrs. S. said to tell the guys that they're doing a great job. So congratulations. Very kind. Appreciate your hard work. Thank you. 877-933-2484 is the number to text your question over. It is time for lots more guy talk ahead, so we want to get your questions. Send them over. We'll be right back. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner?, And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. Dot com. Welcome back to Guide Talk. Stump them with a question and you can win a trip to Hawaii off-season. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't make sure I said that all in the same breath. Yeah, you better have. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to get, I don't want to get wow. myself in trouble. But uh, we, we love hearing questions and we've had probably 500 questions and you guys have been stumped twice that I can remember. I think you it's would a little higher. That, I would remember that. Yes, I <laughs> you would. You remember that, those yes. two? Yeah, those two might yeah. be a little higher than that, but might I, be, but not not too bad. I've forgotten what those two are. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, no, the, we so we love the questions. We love the tough ones, and thank you for sending your questions over yep. thus far. I think it's a really hard one. Next, just watch. It's, no, it's no, no, no. Oh, okay, eight seven seven nine setting us up three three two four <laughs> eight four. Here's a question. David says, "Can communion?" be taken away from a church. I recently saw the Lord's Supper being dispersed at a graduation ceremony. What was it it doing there? Well, well, if you... Let me help you with this one as best I can. If you understand Holy Communion can only be empowered by the priest 
or the pastor with the words of institution, then it's pretty hard to get it out of the church. But many of us have come to believe that any Christian can distribute communion, but it's under the authority of the church. In other words, we're not asking Christians just to start distributing communion. But if they have a small group at home, if they have family members that are believers coming to town and they want to do that, they have the church's authority and permission to do that. What the church has always tried to do is not let that turn into something that's magical for people. And that was the problem for a long time. That's why they tried to be a little more strict with it. But Jesus gave no rules on top of it. He simply said, you know, do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. He put no structure on it beyond that. And besides that, the First Communion wasn't in a church. It was at a dinner table. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, there was no church structure. There no. was no 501c3. There was no <laughs> no, group of, of elders or uh, ordained pastor no. in a row. There's none of that stuff. And in fact, arguably, for the first, uh, you know, many, many years, you had small groups of people meeting in homes, and that That's was right. the church. Amen. All right, gentlemen, do you have any advice for someone who is spiritually and physically exhausted? I think of Elijah in 1 Kings 19. I would ask that person, first of all, do you have any understanding of why you're exhausted? What is it that's coming at you? Sometimes lies can make you exhausted. Sometimes the abuse of others can do that. So that needs to be dealt with as well. But the bottom line for dealing with this. And again, as I mentioned, I've worked with plenty of doctors and and psychiatrists over the years. There is nothing better than a Christian small group of people who will listen to you, hold you accountable, remind you what the Word of God says, and interact with you and be patient with you and do this over time. I get renewed as a pastor, Uh, not because I do a Sunday service. A lot of people are there who say great sermon, all this and that. I get renewed by Christians who individually listen to me, Take me aside. This group here renews me every week. Every Thursday, Mm. I'm renewed when I come and I spend this time with you guys. So we need that desperately, and we don't do enough of that. And I advise whoever this is, find a group of two or three people you can do that with who you trust. You know, figuratively, what I've told people that were in a similar position, you know what? You need to climb up into the lap of Christ and tell him that you're just exhausted and he'll put his arms around you and restore your strength. Our strength is in Christ. And so sometimes we just need to rest in his arms. Agreed. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, That's right. and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. It says it all. Now, I think that's a a salvation verse primarily, but every day that you walk with Christ, you can say to him, I'm weary, give me your rest. It's interesting, with all the counseling I've been privileged to do, when Christians do that at home by themselves, the level of which they get out of that weariness is small. Even though they go to Jesus, and I'm all for going to Jesus, when they finally get with other Christians and do that and verbalize it out loud instead of just in their heart, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works through that and how I see a much larger percentage of people get healing and get renewed. Because I think we forget that our Lord Jesus Christ said he is the head of the church. We are his body. We are not simply a metaphor. We are literally his body in the world, and therefore what we do has an impact on others, and we are meant to do that together and even promised. What did you said it earlier, Jeff, where two or three are gathered in my name. Mm-hmm. So there's that small group again. Let me read one more passage, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes or restores my soul. Yep. Yes. If you are weary and burdened, turn to him. I love the picture of climbing up onto Christ's lap. Me too. All right, gentlemen, nice job. Here's the next question. The predestination argument is so divisive, but I see it as irrelevant because as a Christian, we are to do the same thing, live for God and tell others regardless. Am I right? Well, I will start on this one. I mean, this question comes up often on Guy Talk. Um, Bill, we were just doing it on when I'm on, on Tuesday, and this question came up as well. Every doctrine is important. So I, I don't want to 
dismiss any particular doctrine. Uh, We want to understand the Word of God properly. Paul says to Timothy, guard your doctrine closely. We should understand truth. We want to be uh, that workman, one approved, who correctly handles the Word. That's on on every doctrine. But, But the question is right in this sense. We can have differences of opinions about doctrines, and as long as they're not the core, the kind of the die for, did Christ rise again? Is he God in the flesh, born of a virgin? Those kinds of core Christian doctrines. Um, Our understanding of salvation can be different. Uh, It's not that it's not important, but we can still be brothers in the Lord uh, and be saved and have fellowship with one another, even if we disagree on some of these important doctrines. How was that? That's good. All right. If predestination means you have no choice, you have no opportunity— that either the Lord's going to choose you or not choose you, I reject that biblically. I do not see that in the rest of Scripture. When I look at the word predestined in there, I see it much more as the Lord has a plan for your life. He has a destination. He has a purpose. Your job and my job is to listen to the Lord and walk in that, and then we will arrive where we're supposed to be to be like our Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it's too easy to go in the direction of, well, he chose some, but he didn't choose others, and it doesn't matter. You can be a pastor and preach the gospel and win thousands of people to Christ, but if you're not chosen, you're out. I th- That's a wrong understanding. I, I think the counsel you give, Tom, is, is, is excellent because the word predestined or any of its variations is only found four places in Scripture. Right. And so you have to take the rest of Scripture, which is the best commentary on any passage, and that's what you're really referring to. And that's why you've come to the position, and I have as well, that you reject that notion that you just described because the rest of Scripture does not support that interpretation. All right. Uh, Gentlemen, I'm finding myself repenting of the same sin over and over and having an ongoing struggle with that very same sin. How do I break out of this cycle? One of the ways to do it is if you're doing it privately, Mm. stop doing it that way. (laughs) Go find other Christians that have either struggled with the same thing or have an understanding, or you know you can talk to them and they're not going to throw you away. They're going to listen and pray. Most often uh, when I hear this out of people, they have been struggling for years and years and years with a private sin and they keep going to the Lord But it's when I can get them with other Christians, and sometimes sins that we have to deal with take time. It just doesn't go away the moment you repent. Sometimes it's a process because the devil's working hard. But it is through his people then that the Lord ministers to us and brings that change. And I know that's what's worked in my life for the last 50, 60 years, and I encourage you to do that as well. I I teach men this all the time in, in my ministry. I said that if you want to eradicate a repeated sin in your life, it's always been a two-step process. Mm -hmm. It begins with confession where you acknowledge that you've broken God's standard, that it is indeed sin. It's the kind of, and and that sin is what drove Jesus Christ to the cross. But removing it through confession must be followed with replacing it with truth, or otherwise you create a void, and nature pours a void. Because that sin will find its way back in again. I think it's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42 and so forth, that talks about cleaning out the house. And if you don't replace, um, uh, you don't take uh, 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 occupancy of that place, the enemy can come back in and it's seven times worse. Maybe that's kind of what you're experiencing. So it begins with removal through confession, and it's followed by replacing it with truth and then committing yourself to acting or living in that same direction over an extended period of time. And I believe God will break that bondage in your life. I think this idea of sin being in darkness, John chapter 3 says, true light has come into the world, but men loved the darkness because their deeds were evil. Bring sin into light. Find a group of men like you both have described and bring it to light. And I think that will help. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll take a little break and come right back with lots more guide talk or guys who talk 877-933-2444. Eight four is the text line to send your question over, and I hope you do. 877-933-2484. My panel is Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. Looking forward to hearing from you. Be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. 
let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Hey. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. I'm back with the Guy Talk panel, and we're looking for your questions. Here's a question, gentlemen. Could someone spend an eternity apart from Christ because nobody prayed for them? Oh, interesting question. Um, you know, God has revealed himself to all mankind. So Romans 1 says that all creation declares God's glory yeah. so that man is without excuse. In other words, you open your eyes up, you see creation, and you should know inherently there is a creator, just as if you look at a painting and know inherently that there was a painter. God also says that he puts eternity in man's heart so that man has an inherent understanding that there is an eternity. And he says in Romans 2 that the righteous requirements of the law are written on man's heart. So we know what's right and wrong inherently. Um, as as just for as being, so I don't think it's necessary for someone to specifically pray for a person. Um, God has, and by the way, God says He stands at the door and knock. He sends the Holy Spirit to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. So God's working overtime to That's draw right. all men to Himself. And and salvation is not dependent on somebody's prayer. I'm just hoping somebody's going to pray for me because I'll be. Saved. That's almost like works. Hmm. It's yep. saying, oh, Good gee whiz, point. this has got to be yeah. done in order for me to be saved. So we're substituting the unlimited uh, gift of grace from God by saying, well, there's something else that needs to happen in order for me to enjoy eternity. Hmm. I have come to the conclusion that my prayers do not change the Lord's mind. In other words, I've given <laughs> great suggestions, but it doesn't hmm. change anything. I can pray for somebody, and that doesn't make him try any more or any less. Mm. What I do realize is that when I pray, it's often the Holy Spirit works in my heart to wake me up to what I should be doing in this Amen. situation. Or maybe I should be calling this person, or maybe I should be supplying them with some food, whatever it may be. So I'd say pray for the person always, but people that aren't prayed for, there are people all over the world like that, still, like you said, Jeff, are not going to stand before the Lord with an excuse. Mm. I never heard. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. The Lord will deal with them justly. It, and by the way, nothing we just all said here means don't pray for the person pray who's for lost. Absolutely. Still pray for them. That's right. That's right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next question. Are Christians hypocritical when they judge people? Well, it depends on what you mean by judgment, because God expects us to be discerning. He expects us to be evaluative. The judging that the Scripture is against is when you become the judge, jury, and executioner. When you are condemning somebody, um, that's in the hands of God alone. So that kind of judging and, and judging with condemnation is wrong. Yeah. But being discerning and evaluative, it's just like the Bereans who studied the Scriptures to determine whether or not what Paul was saying is true. So the idea is, again that um, you need to go ahead and rely on the Holy Spirit to understand what is meant by being obedient to the Word. I'm very pleased my mom and dad were judgmental, if you want to use that word. Mm -hmm. When I was in elementary school, we had a guy come in and demonstrate what if you put one drop of gasoline in a tube and then throw a match in, it went off like a, a gun, right? So I decided I want to do that at home with about 50 <laughs> drops of gasoline. <laughs> and And... I, I was I was just getting ready to do that when my dad saw me, and he said, son, what are you doing? And I explained to him, he goes, no, that is not a good thing to do. You're going to get hurt. Put that away right now, and don't you ever do that again. Well, I'm now 74, and I'm thankful. Yeah. You know, there is good judgment, and then there is the judgment you're talking about. We're not to condemn people. That's yeah. up to the Lord. Yes. But we are to tell people the truth about what's right and wrong. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. The... The word for judge is krino in the Greek, and it actually you've you've both described these two aspects of this one word. One is to condemn, the other is to judge or discern, and that both of those are part of the definition of that word. So in English, we get in Matthew where it says, "Do not judge your brothers," but then Paul says, "Shouldn't we judge all things?" Right, and aren't we going to judge the world one day? So we do discern, we don't condemn. That's right. All right, nicely done. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you have experiences in life when you 
when you're when you when you're walking away, you think to yourself, eh, "I probably couldn't share Jesus with that person after that experience." Does that seem like a question you don't because quite of an get? argument or could have been an argument, could have been uh, something you said, could have been a joke you told, could have been a way you treated somebody that you walked away going, "Eesh." Yeah. Boy, I don't know if I could turn around and share Christ with that person now. I think we destroy our testimony way too often by our own actions. I right? agree. And so, you know, one of the things that a good lawyer will do to a character witness is to uh, try to point out the, all their flaws and make them less credible. Well, we tend to do that, and then we become less credible of a witness for Christ. I absolutely think we can do that. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't. But I think we do it. I think oftentimes when we are in a situation like that with somebody, we do walk away and we realize we failed. We shouldn't have done this. What most of us don't do is pick up the phone and say, Greg, what I just said to you was wrong or the way I responded was wrong. Please forgive me. You know, I want you to understand that I love you and that you're important to me and you're important to the Lord Jesus. Well, you know what? That opens up a door. But I think most of us walk away without any understanding of how to renew. And I always tell people, never, ever, ever burn a bridge with somebody. Hmm. You never know when you, the Lord will call you to that's go right. back over it. Yep. Mm. All right, here's a comment that's got some heaviness to it. I, I'm a recently divorced woman, married 36 years to a minister that we pastored for 15 years. He left me for a woman half my age and multiple addictions that I had no clue of. We have eight grandchildren, three grown children, and he's left us all. I'm divorced now for about a year, and I'm really struggling with self-worth and who I am anymore. I feel like my faith is very strong, and it's uh, the only reason I'm still alive. I just need some direct wisdom. What wisdom can we share? One thing, you don't get your worth by the sinfulness of another person. Your worth is always in Christ, and so you can't hold yourself accountable for decisions somebody else has made, because we talked about it earlier in the show about being responsible to, but not for. So that person obviously is living in a life of sin, and there's no reason why you should feel um, inhibited or discouraged or in despair because of somebody else's sin. You suffered the consequences of that person's sin. You didn't deserve it, but it's not your burden to carry. As a pastor, I want to tell this person I'm very sorry for what happened. Yeah. No pastor should ever do this. And as Greg reminded us earlier, the Word of God says we're going to be judged more harshly, those who proclaim the Word of God. Mm-hmm. So I hope your former husband comes around and repents and seeks the Lord to get de- deal with this because he's in trouble. You're hurting and you're lonely, and I understand that. But quite frankly, your identity is not from your husband. Your identity is from the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's where you need to focus. And quite frankly, repeat that over and over and over so that you know, because you are of great value. You expect this kind of behavior in the world. Um, This is what the world does. Why are we surprised when the world acts like the world? But you don't. This shouldn't happen in the church. Unfortunately, it does uh, too often. Um, I just pray for God's comfort to come over you, his peace to just fill you, and for yes. his grace uh, be sufficient for you during this time. Um, as the other guy said, uh, God needs to be even stronger as your anchor and your shield and your help and your strength right now. Uh, and I pray that you have some people around you, strong believers, that can also come alongside of you. Um, and comfort you, all the one another's in Scripture. I hope you have people around you that will come alongside you and, and lift you up during this time. Because this, I, I just I can't fathom somebody leaving all of that, um, especially kids and grandkids and stuff. I have kids and I have grandkids, and I can't imagine separating myself uh, from them for any reason. I would, you know, I'm more than one to do this, Bill. If that person wants to have me contact them. I will give them a chart that I put together on who I am in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of information on there. And again, I encourage you, hang that up where you see it every day and at least spend time repeating two or three of those out loud every day. 
because the devil wants to convince you you're worthless. Hmm. Jesus has a lot more to say about you. Amen. God doesn't want you to be discouraged. It's the enemy that wants you to be discouraged because if he can immobilize you, if he can cause you to bask in your grief, then he knows that there's nothing you're going to be doing that will impact his plan. And so we need to understand that the enemy is fearful of one thing, that we become his formidable foe. Yep. And so he's going to do everything he can to discourage us, to interject despair in our life. Um, and God doesn't see us that way. You're so precious in God's sight. It says in Scripture that God superintended your formation in your mother's womb. Yes. He knew you be it for you everywhere. He set the number of days you would walk this earth. He also said in Ephesians 2.10 that he prepared in advance a purpose for your life. You are precious in God's sight. Don't let the enemy talk you into something that isn't the truth. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to take a little break and come back with more Guy Talk. Send your questions over 877-933-2484. Be right back. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. I hope you've had a good day if you're just climbing in your car or just turned on the radio. It's Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. I've got Greg B, Tom P, Jeff V, and we're ready to take your questions, 877-933-2484. Gentlemen, Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Is that possibly the biggest question in the Bible? It is. I've been there. Caesarea Philippi up in northern Israel where uh, Peter asks, uh, well, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And remember, Peter says and answers the question, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, uh, that's correct, Peter. And on this rock, now, do we want to enter into that discussion? No. (laughs) On this confession of faith, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Well, right there at Caesarea Philippi, there's this cliff that has this cavern and yeah, in the first there. century they believed that that some believed that that was a a portal to the underworld that the, that was like the gates of Hades so he was saying that right there to his disciples i think it's the most important question that can ever be asked because answering that question determines an eternity mm. and so mm. i encourage people to ask that a lot i ask that question a lot and I love to be with people, if this sounds right, that are dying, because I can reassure them if they're believers, and if they're not, I can ask the question. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Isn't that, is that Solomon just trying to give us an understanding of the importance of sensible planning? Well, it doesn't matter how well we plan, how many things come up in our day that we weren't planning on, and how many things do happen to us that we didn't think about. And so I talk to my congregation all the time, be prepared for divine appointments. The Lord may show up in some person or in some situation that he wants you to share with or talk to. And even though you've got a plan for the whole day, uh, you need to, to step into that plan when the moment comes. So I encourage you, yep, make your plans. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand that the Lord has the ultimate plan, and you want to be paying attention to that. You know, life happens between plans, and God's permissive will. God may have a directed path for us to embrace, but we, because we've been given this great gift of free will, can make a decision to divert from that path. And then the enemy will try to convince you, well, you're going to be on the bench now. You're really messed up. God isn't going to—he's done with you. But Scripture says, and it even says in Jeremiah 29 and 11, God has plans, plural, for your life. So what happens when we divert from God's prescribed direction for us uh, to take, and we have free will to deviate from that, God just opens up a whole new series of options for us. He never gives up on us, and he wants to keep bringing us back to that desired path. And that's what I understand is being predestined. The predestined, the Lord knows where he wants to take us. And then no matter how far we get off the track, he is always rearranging the track to get us where we need to go. Yeah, God is, his sovereignty um, means that one day his will will be done in the end on earth as Mm -hmm. it is in heaven. 
And so that's his purpose. His purposes will prevail in the end. And we can point out, that was very deep, by the way. Uh, life happens between our plans. or What did you say? Life, yeah, life happens in between plans. In between plans. Very deep. Uh, so many is the plans of the person's heart. We can plan all we want. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not a condemnation for planning, obviously. But mm-hmm. uh, in the end, God's ways. I, it, I think of the verse in it's Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. So his will will be done. And that's why Greg is the professor, and you and I are the Bible teacher best. That was really deep. <laughs> Life happens in between the plans. <laughs> Very philosophical, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm trying to make sense of this question, and I have to fill in a couple of blanks and why it has just helped me, so that's going to be good. In Ephesians 4, Paul quotes Psalm 68:18 which says, when you ascended on high, you took many captives, you received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. That's that verse. So in Ephesians 4, Paul quotes from Psalm 68, 18. However, it seems that his quotation is very different from the original Hebrew text. How should we reconcile this difference? There's actually a number of New Testament passages that quote from the Old Testament, but it's not exactly as the Old Testament appears in the original Hebrew. And if you recall, I mean, not a lot of people had access to the Old Testament text, so it's not like they could just look it up on their iPhone and quote it word for word. I, I, I think it's as simple as that. Man has, m- many of the Jews would set to memory much of the Old Testament scripture. So if that's the, is the specific question, why isn't it exactly like the Old Testament? Um, that the quotation is very different from the original Hebrew yeah. text. How should we reconcile this difference? Yeah, I think that, I think that is the, the answer is that, um, where are we here? Paul is quoting from memory and, and gets the gist. You can, you can paraphrase a passage and not directly quote it and still get the point across. Yeah, Paul is adapting the passage to his purposes in the New Testament. Um, and there are many New Testament authors that do this, this the same thing, to show that Christ gave gifts to his people from his spoils of victory. All right, here's a comment that just came in, which I like very much. I've come to this place in my walk with Christ where I am totally okay with some mysteries being mysteries. Some things are supposed to be mysteries, and that's okay. Misunderstanding puts me in a place of humility, and I love it. Praise Jesus. That's right. That's right. Well, we're talking about an infinite God. Here we are as finite creatures trying to understand an infinite God. There are going to be mysteries. Hmm. There are going to be open questions that we have, and that's a wonderful thing because the mystery adds to um, the character of God and our understanding and adoration of Him. Yeah, how does a finite person truly understand an infinite or infinite God? Yeah. Right. Um, but but the things that He has given us in His Word, we can understand. So don't yeah. let that stop you from seeking understanding through His Word. That's why I know there's laughter in heaven when I suggest to the Lord what He ought to do. <laughs> <laughs> A mind outside this world created this world. Yeah. Yes. Amen. There would, of course, be mysteries yes. and understandings. And I, I love that his position was it puts me in a place of humility, and yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And it also gives you peace. I don't have to understand everything. All I need to know is who Jesus ultimately is and what his will is. And everything else is okay. I don't need to figure everything else out. I need him. Isn't that what walking by faith, not by sight, is really all about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. We, I want to invite you to, to join us for the Faith Radio Day of Forgiveness, which is coming up on June 26. So every program, every conversation will be focused on what the Bible says about forgiving others with powerful stories of why you should and how to do it. So be encouraged as you work to find peace. And listen to the Faith Radio Day of Forgiveness on June 26th. That's all the show we have for today. Thanks to my power panel, Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V., for being such outstanding friends and brothers in Christ. We're going to say goodnight for now, but 
I hope you have a wonderful evening, whatever awaits you tonight, that you find peace and comfort in knowing that God loves you. And as you lay your head on the pillow, just know that I love you too. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.